This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jumrukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey, and welcome to the I Love Success Podcast. If you are new to the show, I want to say welcome. This is episode 315. Yes, I'm a former world medalist in karate that love getting help from others. There have been so many people in my life that have been in my corner and shared because in the world of martial arts and sports, it's a natural thing. And uh, I think it was, I don't know how many years ago now, but before I started this show, I listened to a show called London Real. And I used to listen to it when I was at the gym, when I was running, when I was walking. And I was just so mesmerized by these raw, honest, and deep conversations, human to human. So I decided to start this podcast. And um, we're more than 300 episodes in. I'm super grateful for all of my guests that have taken the time to come here and share what they've learned in their life. And I'm even more grateful for you here today that you're listening or watching wherever you are in the world. We have listeners from, I think, 40 plus countries now. And uh, I'm just grateful. All of this is totally free, but there is tremendous value. So I hope you take notes. I hope you find that one idea that can make your life a little bit better because that's why we're here today. And I'm super grateful to have a fellow athlete uh, or a former athlete, I would say, but I, I, I guess we're always athletes or feel like that. <laughs> His name is Justin Bookie. He's a former lawyer. He's an award-winning marketing strategist. He's a global ping pong, ping pong player. You know, he's he's done a lot in his world. He's active now with his new book, Ping Pong Leadership. We're going to talk about that and also talk about what he has learned in his life and how you can use that to be better in business and life. So Justin Bucci, welcome to the I Love Success podcast. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm really happy to be here. It's let's have some fun. And I, I think uh, before we get started, I mentioned, you know, I'm I'm from a small town in Sweden called called Halmstad. And we have a very big table tennis community there. I don't know if you know who Jurgen Persson is. Uh, oh yes. He's he's a friend of mine. And I always we always compete about winning the the local there was always a vote for the best athlete in the city. Um and uh, he always won because he performed better than me. I got better votes because I, I had the company I worked for had like 600 employees and I masked email them. So they all voted for me, but he, he got the award. Uh, so it was always that type of friendly competition, but super nice guy and uh, always watched table tennis since I was a kid uh, in our in our town. So I know how much dedication it takes to become good in a sport where, you know, timing, reaction, movement is so important. So first of all, kudos of being a table tennis player or ping pong player. Thanks. And I must say, Jorgen Persson is one of the legends. I actually met him in Las Vegas at maybe the U.S. Open of table yeah. tennis. Oh, wow. And he is an amazing player. Yeah. I. Sweden is certainly a hot spot for table tennis. They really take it seriously there. And yeah. Yeah, they do. So. Uh, how did you get into, you know, table tennis or ping pong and how, 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 how did that, you know, come about and how has that affected your, your life? I'm so glad it came into my life and it was a long time ago. And we, when I was six years old, we moved into a new house and it had this junky old table in the basement and I'd never really seen it before. And my parents were like, Oh, we'll, we'll show you what this table is all about. It's like, really, it's a, it's green with a white stripe. What is that all about? <laughs> anyway, so they were both very good. They they taught me, and I just never turned back. I have uh, three older sisters, and we were all kind of competitive, and we used to play till midnight. And when my friends would come over, when dinner guests would come over, anybody who came over, it's like, come on, we're going downstairs. Yeah. It's like, Justin, you got to do the dishes first. Okay, <laughs> after the dishes, we're going downstairs. We're going to play ping pong. So... Uh, 
and even so even from a young age, I just really took to it. I played other sports and I was a decent athlete, but I just, um, you know, I was kind of a small kid. I got pushed around because I was an easy target, like in junior high and high school. Uh, but I excelled at table tennis and I saw that I could actually beat up on all these bigger guys at the table tennis table. And surprisingly, I got a little respect for that. And they really actually respected the talent and the work that went into playing that, even if these were the big hulking football guys, right? Yeah. And that was a pleasant surprise for me. It's like, wow, you know, this is worthwhile in many ways. Yeah. yeah. And did you guys play that? We played a lot. I don't know how you say it in English, but to translate it directly is round ping is like... Uh, w when you go around and we around the world, we call it. Yeah, around the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Even in a small place where you, you hit, then you have to run to the other side of the table and keep the rally going. Oh, fun. And in school, I remember in school, people took it seriously. They bro some fights broke out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we de we played all sorts of crazy stuff, blowing the ball back and forth across the table until you like hallucinate and pass out, or yeah. all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> Can we talk about that? Uh, you, you said, you know, being a smaller kid, not really, you know, having, you're surrounded by people that, you know, quote unquote, peak faster physically, right? Uh, I was in the same boat. I was small. I was chubby. I lost all my friends because I, you know, was both small and chubby and I wasn't good at sports. But in the martial arts world, I started excelling and it gave me some type of confidence and also uh, that type of uh, respect. Uh, and that's why I advocate for sports for any young kid, uh, because when you're good at something, it it makes you feel good, right? Absolutely. I'm a huge proponent of team and individual sports. I did both. I love soccer because it's so fluid and it's so teamwork oriented and there's no way I mean, I guess if you're a young Lionel Messi, you can dominate a game when you're 10 years old, but usually it really, it's a team effort. It's such a beautiful thing when done right. And then individual sports, it's accountability. It's you get the glory for the wins and you take all the blame for the losses. And you, it's like a one-to-one -one ratio. You put in effort and focus and sweat and you're going to get out results. I love that. And so I think that's so important for character development as a kid. And it took me a while to get to realize that, I think, because we're not mature when we're in fourth grade, yeah. when we're, you know, 10 years old or 12 years old, we're impatient. We're maybe too emotional, not emotional enough. We don't trust other kids, maybe we don't want to hand the ball off. We're selfish. And so it takes a long time to build up trust with teammates or trust in yourself that, okay, if I keep training at this, there's just, there's no way I'm going to get worse. I can only get better, but it, it, it takes a while because I tried a bunch of sports. It's like, Oh, hockey. Okay. I'll try hockey for three weeks. And I didn't get any better in three weeks. And it's like, Oh, I guess I'm not a good hockey player. You know, that, that was my mentality back then. But then I, since I was always playing table tennis and I started to play against better and better players and then, then adults, when I was 12, I used to ride my little bike, my one speed bike, like, you know, five miles to the lo the, cl the closest table tennis club to play adults. Cause I wanted more of a challenge. And then I, I was blown away because these people had spins I had never seen before or serves I had never seen before. It's like, oh, I'm terrible. I can't handle these serves. And But I still had a, I loved the challenge and it was still exciting to me. So I kept going. And then like six months later, I played the guy I played on the first night. And it's like, oh, I don't think he's trying as hard. You know, I don't think, I don't think he's giving me the same serves because I can hit half of them back now. So he must be really nice. And then I talked to him and he says, oh, I'm doing the same exact serves I did six months ago. It's like, really? And I was like, well, what, what just happened? It's like, well, you're getting better kid. Yeah. You know, you're practicing. And I, that really like, um, one of the first times I just saw firsthand the amazing rewards for just sticking with something. 
you know, because it's, it sounds really obvious, but, and I think unless you live and breathe that and really um, witness how good immediate progress can feel or gradual progress, it doesn't sink in. You have to kind of live through that. Yeah. You know, and I'm And uh, how, like, why do you think you took, uh, you know, table tennis so seriously? Maybe it was um, process of elimination. And like I said, I played a lot of sports. And um, sometimes um, it's just, it could be random circumstance. It could be that one inflection point when, say, my mom, who is very athletic in her day, she saw that I was very interested in table tennis. And so she bought me a couple books. And this is way back in the 70s when I was growing up. And there was no internet. There was no television coverage of table tennis in America because we didn't take it seriously that much. Yeah. And so I poured over these books. And that alone, it sounds crazy. It's hard to learn table tennis from a book. <laughs> Like I'm sure karate, skiing, volleyball, it's hard to learn from a book, but as much as I was very studious. So I poured over every page. I studied, there were, there were charts and graphics. And I tried to replicate that in my motions. And I tried to understand the strategy and put myself in the head of the authors. And those were kind of my first real high level mentors. And so that was an inflection point. That was just this thing that my mom gave me this huge gift of just, oh, here's a couple of books. I'll just give them to you. Right. Yeah. And then that was big. And maybe if she had given me a book on, on soccer or hockey, you know, who knows, but there's a lot of circumstances. We all come from different families and cultures and geographies. Right. And it just so happened. My parents were good at that. And I mean, you grew, you grew up in Sweden, which is again, a real hot spot for table tennis. Yeah. And if you had met Jorgen person at a young age, who knows, maybe he could have been a mentor for you and you'd be all about table tennis right now. We'd be meeting in tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let me ask you this. When, when did you realize that this is something that you wanted to pursue seriously and how, how did that go about and how, how was that, uh, you know, focus on something so, uh, you know, what's the word for it being so like laser focused on becoming as good as you to uh, you can become probably when i was starting starting to get really serious in college about studies and career and looking ahead 10 20 30 years what am i going to do with myself in my life, in my career, I was doing, I was playing a lot of volleyball and tennis along with table tennis, right? I just love sports and surfing. Um, but as my time got more and more valuable, I had to focus. I actively chose one indoor sport and one outdoor sport to start with yeah. because I just, I couldn't keep doing them all. And I wasn't that good at all of them. I just, but I loved them. Yeah. But I was definitely just better at table tennis. I, I just just physically in the focus, and I was already better at that than any other sport, right? So I figured, I, okay, I, I love it. I love it because it was the strategy, the physics, the discipline just seemed to suit my personality. Yeah. And so I knew if I'm going to really stick with one sport, that would be it. I also um, uh, probably chose uh, probably chose beach volleyball as the other one again not going to be my path to the Olympics at five, seven, <laughs> but I was a decent setter. So I <laughs> set people up well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then law school came along and, you know, career and work and then kids all the time, all the while I figure, okay, I'm just going to have to focus on one sport now. Yeah. And especially indoors, even more convenient because it's, um, it can be played anytime, anywhere indoors. So table tennis was the natural. I really didn't even think about it because it was always with me. I, it, it like followed me. It chose me as much as I chose it, honestly. Yeah. Right. There'd be a table. I would be invited to play. There's a table. I want to play. <laughs> Go home, visit family. Oh, we got to play. Yeah. Right. I, I almost didn't have a choice, but I, I did not resist that because I loved it. Yeah. And, um, 
when did you be uh, how did you decide to you know uh, go to law school and how was that experience combined with sport it was tough i graduated during a recession and i graduated undergrad during a recession i was doing job interviews and i thought i was well qualified for a several jobs in my arena, which would be marketing, communications, advertising. And it was just really tough. And I thought, this is a good time to take a step back and maybe take a gap year, which I didn't call it that because it wasn't a thing back then, but take it some time and just work and maybe study real hard to take the LSAT. My dad was a lawyer and it was inspiring to me to see the way he thought we, he would be basically cross-examining us at the breakfast table sometimes. I mean, we couldn't get away with anything. He was a federal prosecutor for 40 years. Wow. And I learned a lot just from that. So I thought, okay, I, I would feel remiss if I didn't, didn't at least try this amazing challenge. I knew it would be a big challenge because I'm more of a creative thinker than analytical, I believe. And law school, practice of law is very analytical, certainly can be creative, but um, I sensed deep down it would be good for me. It would be a good balance for me. And I did it, I got into good school and I did okay there. And it was not easy, but I really liked to apply myself and it felt good to be really pushed, really pushed. And I didn't have a lot of time for table tennis though. So yeah. that was hard, but I figure this is a time in my life. I just got to focus. I can't be all over the place. Yeah. And I became a lawyer, practiced law, still didn't have a lot of time, got married, wanted to see my wife sometimes, even though I was working long hours. Um, so for, there were several years where I wasn't playing that much. Yeah. I did then transition into marketing for like web 1.0 in the late nineties. And that that's when I really got back into table tennis and I started doing competitions again. I found an Olympian coach. Yeah. She was former number five in China and she was on our, our Olympic team in the U S national champion in singles and doubles. Amazing. She's still my coach. I'm still active. I play the masters circuit now. And it keeps me sane, keeps me fit. I went to Bulgaria last year, had a great time at a master's tournament over there in the Black Sea, coastal town. And it's such a great way just to always give me a challenge and an outlet for my competitive spirit, even now. Yeah. I think the, um, we say grow or die, right? It's good to have challenges in life and... Uh, it's interesting to see how like how we can see problems in life or how we can see growing older and uh, i i saw a post the other day and it was like uh, you're waking up as 39 and wish you were 18 but what if you can think that you were you're 90 and waking up as 39 and you just got 51 more years back yeah. And I think it's such a play in life that all of our problems can actually be fascinating if we're interested in us as human beings. And, and, and I love the study of other human beings. And I'm curious, so you're, you're not practicing law anymore, right? No. And was that, what was the reason that you stopped practicing law uh, because you put so much time and energy to become a lawyer? Right. I like to say that I still, I'm not practicing law anymore, but I use those skills constantly. Yeah. So it was never a on and off switch. Yeah. It's the power of persuasion, research, writing, organizing thoughts, building a case, executing against that. Those are skills I use constantly. When I was practicing law, it was with a private firm. It was in DC. We were doing cutting edge work in communications law, internet, satellite, an exciting time. And yet it could be a grind. I'd get in the office at nine something and leave at nine something. And uh, 
I'm glad I had that experience, but that's when I got married during those years and I wasn't seeing my wife very much. And I also saw my clients that this is in the nineties, the internet work we were doing. I had clients that were working lower hours, making more money, have more fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's like something's wrong with the, this equation. <laughs> So that helped me decide, okay, I'm just, I just started taking web administration classes, graphic design classes, and just prepping myself to enter this whole new world of web development. And so I just made the leap yeah, and never looked back. And then I, I did that for years and years with large agencies, small agencies, and started my own agency. And that was really fulfilling. That's awesome. And I, I think it's like, I think it's very cool to hear you talk about this because uh, what, what I see a lot that people become something that they think is what they really want to become because it's a it's a rewarding society to be a doctor, to be an engineer, to be a lawyer. And it's it could be amazing things and a lot of people are truly enjoying them. But sometimes in reality, it becomes a, a grind, a hustle. And uh, you're trying to live up to this expectation and I think it's a beautiful thing that you can have several careers in your life and doing that with courage. Uh, how how was the external world when you stepped down for being a lawyer and doing something else? Was that a hard uh, you know, conversation with the people around you or was it very easy? Uh, because I know uh, in society, there's a lot of peer pressure and not everybody has the courage. And that's what makes me sad when I see people that are really good at something, but they don't enjoy it anymore. And they're, they all, they're also scared of doing something else. Yeah. Luckily, I have a pretty accepting circle around me, yeah. friends, family, and my wife. But sure, there was some raised eyebrows. There was a little bit of pushback. Uh, I think my... <laughs> Probably my in-laws were like, oh, we thought our daughter married a nice lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're still nice, but you're not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to assure them, I still have a plan. Yeah. I'm not going to go play ping pong all day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and certainly on the job scene, when I was interviewing for new presenters, I was like, oh, I see on your resume, you're a lawyer. Where, where's your pinstripe suit? Where's your briefcase? Aren't you supposed to be in court? It's like, well, there's a lot more to law than just wearing a pinstripe suit and showing up in court. I was not a litigator. Yeah. Uh, so that was an interesting transition. But I always, I just, I never felt like I did things the cookie cutter way anyway. I mean, playing table, table tennis is not a cookie cutter type of yeah. pursuit in America right? It's taken seriously throughout Asia, Europe, other parts of the world, not as much here, but hopefully gaining. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Yeah. Now kudos to you. I mean, we have one life and to, to experience it fully, even though it's not always a straight path, it's, it's something that's beautiful. And that's why we have this show. Uh, let's go into your, your book, because uh, that's how we got connected. And I'm, Obviously, I, I love the relationship between life, sport, business, because that's how I always think about martial arts. You know, when you talk about being a black belt, it's not it's not an award. It's something that you earn every single day, not only when you go into the dojo, it's who you are as a human being. At, at least that's how it's supposed to be in my mind, how my father taught me. If you're good at something, you know how to handle yourself in life and you're a black belt of life every day. Of course, you stumble and fall, but you come back to character. Your word is your bond. That's why I felt so bad when we have to reschedule because normally this doesn't happen to me, but changes in my life, I'm growing, I'm learning. Uh, so how, when did you decide to write a book and like, how was that process? Probably about 15 years ago, I realized that these two parallel lives I've been living don't need to be separate. Yeah. I've lived parallel lives really since I was six, eight, 10 years old, where I would have my ping pong in the basement with friends and family. And then I'd 
go off on my own to the adult centers and play. And then I had school and friends and other activities, right? They just didn't cross that much. My friends weren't that into table tennis. Yeah. Yeah, my family was a, a bit, not like me, though. And then I grew up in high school, same thing. I had my sports and the cool sports. I did track. I did wrestling and tried rugby, but I got smashed because these huge guys were also football players. But my table tennis was also on the side. And some people would make fun of it because they saw it as a wimpy sport. Yeah. Law school, certainly I just went off and played when I could. Even now, my professional colleagues are usually not into table tennis. It's a separate yeah. thing. And then I, 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 all these job situations I had, it was always separate. So um, during these two these decades of my life, I had the great privilege of training with the best in table tennis, like world champions, national champions, Olympians, learning deep philosophy. My coach, she's not just teaching us here, here, here's how you turn your wrist on a forehand. She's teaching us deep thoughts and beliefs about yourself. Who do you want to be? What are you afraid of? Who do you want to become? Where are you comfortable? Where are you uncomfortable? How do you take care of that? It's, it's a guru type of position, not just a coach, right? So I was learning these deep philosophies. Okay, that's one side. The other side, business, law, marketing, I was also very lucky. I was learning from amazing leaders. I worked at XPRIZE. I got to work with Peter Diamandis directly. I got to work with like the CEO of Qualcomm, uh, Peter Jacobs for a little bit. And I also got to learn just through networking and professional situations, guys like Nolan Bushnell, who created Atari, amazing lessons about how these people, they all have challenges. They have, they have mistakes. They scrape their knees and they keep going and they have winning habits and they have habits they have to discard. Right. Yeah. So maybe 15 years ago, I realized there's so much overlap. I started thinking about, wow, I don't need to be, I don't need to separate these two worlds as much as I think I do. Yeah. And it's, I started to Think about, wow, there's a lot of principles that apply to both. I see them. I see them now in my everyday living. I see how these winners in all worlds at any table, right, can succeed. And then the pandemic came around. And I had some time to sit and really think a little more. And so I distilled these Pong principles, I call them. And I have, a, I have more than 18, but there's 18 in the book. And they're really about the crossover of leadership and ping pong and leadership. I define broadly. That's anybody who leads themselves or others into greater opportunities for success. Right. And the, so the crossover is that group plus anyone who has any appreciation for ping pong. And it, it is a number one or two sport in the world. So almost everyone can relate to ping pong in some way. You don't have to be a pro anyway. Yeah. So that, so I just distilled those down and, um, that actually just flowed out and that flowed out. It was very easy because those are, I realized those are always in my head. I just had to sit down and really crystallize those. So yeah, there's 18 in the book. Um, and you're talking about, it was interesting. You brought up karate and is it's a way of achieving daily success and it's a daily process. It's not something you just win or you earn a black belt and you're done. That's not it. Yeah. It's something you do. It's something you believe in and it's something you apply every day in the way you see the world, right? Yeah. So that's, that's Pong principle 18, which is check the boxes and then move beyond. So what that means is there's always boxes we have to check, whether it's in school, relationships, how we treat other people, how we treat ourselves, diet, exercise, spirituality, whatever. You need to check them and then keep rechecking them and always cover the fundamentals. But only then you can move beyond to the really upper level elite category of the fine points and those little differentiators that put you over the top, and let you win. And so for like, for example, um, and the, the, all the book is all full of stories. I, I want to make sure it's entertaining and it flows. It's not just academic principles, it's stories. So like this one guy, a uh, sports journalist was watching Kobe Bryant years ago. He's famous for being the first in the gym, the last to leave. And this is when he was like a 15, 16 year veteran in the league, right? He's doing free throws for like 
45 minutes before a game, just nothing but free throws and maybe some basic dribbles, basic stuff. You right? And the guy's like, Kobe, you're like the, you're the best in the world. Probably you're a top five player, whatever. And you're spending all the time on these free throws. Like, you know, isn't there anything, anything else you could be doing with this time? He goes, and Kobe kind of chuckles and says, why do you think I'm the best in the world? Because I'm doing these right now. I'm doing the basics. I've learned to love the basics. And that's what you have to do. And it seems mundane. It seems overly routine, but you got to check those boxes. But then once you do, it becomes automatic, hopefully. And then it frees up your higher level thinking to accomplish the behind the back passes, switching the ball in midair <laughs> behind the back jam. Right. Same with table tennis, same with karate, I'm sure. Yeah, no, you're right. I it's um it's not like I I train karate, it's I am a martial artist. Uh and uh first of all, kudos to you for finishing a book. Uh it's it's not an easy task. I've I've written four books myself. It's an exciting journey, uh, but it's it it takes a lot. And uh, what I love with books and uh, it's is that somebody is distilling their whole life, what they learn, uh, and makes kind of a story about that, so you can use that and you can buy that for twenty bucks. Like books should cost. Like these types of books should cost hundred, two hundred dollars at least. I think because <laughs> there's so much knowledge. A podcast like this should be very expensive, and I hope if you're listening to this that that you take the advice seriously. That this is not just another show that you are listening to for fun. That's awesome, but that doesn't do anything. If you if you take some of the things that we have done to complete the project to better yourself, that's now we're talking. Now this is interesting. And uh, I I want to talk about a couple of you know the your principles uh, that I'm that I'm curious about. I want to see the relationship to business, but also from a selfish perspective from from martial arts as well, because I do think there's a lot of similarities with you know table tennis, ping pong, martial arts, but life and business. So. Uh, Talking about punk principle number two, it's a rhythm game. Can you just talk about that and how that relates to life? Absolutely. There is a rhythm to everything. And it's you don't need to be musical or trained in music to understand and feel it. The way we walk, breathe, eat, speak, do everything. There is a rhythm. And starting in table tennis... We all have our unique rhythm of how we stroke the ball. So some people are more, say, the way you stroke the ball aggressively off the bounce. It might be bump, 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 bump. And some people maybe take the, they hit the ball on the top of the bounce, bump, 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 bump. Some are more standing back, really crank up if they're a power player, maybe after the top of the bounce, bump, 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 bump. Similar to a baseline tennis game versus serve and volley, rushing the net, being more aggressive that way, right? So we all have our different rhythms and micro rhythms, and and that's just three. But there's a infinite spectrum between those. And to the trained ear or even the untrained ear, you get used to hearing these little micro variations. So you need to establish what your own comfortable rhythm is. If you're an aggressive, very quick player, I tend to be aggressive. I like to be a little closer to the table. Sometimes I'll be three, five foot behind the table, but I'm not like an eight to 10 foot behind the table person. That's a little more defensive or highly offensive with huge power. You need to find out the space you're comfortable in. And that affects your rhythm because it's a timing thing. And you need to establish that and get in a rhythm. When you're working out with a partner, you have the rhythm. Boom, 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 boom. And if one of you is off rhythm, it's hard to get in this sync. And in competition, you'd, you'd think, well, where's the rhythm there? Well, you still need to establish your rhythm in competition, understand your opponent's rhythm, establish it, and then know when to break it for an advantage, for surprise, for a sudden change of direction. And so that's putting rhythm to use tactically. Now, let's say in business, 
We all have our communication rhythms. We all know people who answer a text immediately or some who don't answer it five days later, if at all. Same with email, same with a Slack comment, whatever. It can be really jarring if someone's like, oh, wow, their text came right back to me. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And that can cause some discomfort and it can cause some undue pressure in business if you are using the wrong rhythm with the wrong person or yourself. You're putting too much pressure on yourself, maybe not enough pressure on yourself. We used to have large clients on, with large teams in these agencies, you know, these 10,000 person digital agencies I used to work at. Let's say that's, you know, it's a $4 million web backend refresh we're doing front and back end. And we are aggressively saying we can do this in four months and it's going to be expensive, but you want results. We, we have the top end professionals. We can do it. And they, and they sign on. Yep. Let's do it. Here's the milestones. Every six days, we'll have a checkpoint approval. Let's do it. Inevitably, it seemed <laughs> we would get to this point because our teams were aggressive and disciplined. Okay. Here's checkpoint number 16, 24 hour turnaround. And the client would be like, Oh, well, our VP of strategies in Singapore right now, he can't even look at this until Thursday. We're like, well, okay, that screws up the schedule. Yeah. We had to be polite about it. That means maybe a change order. Maybe it's going to cost more because we have resources allocated to that. And so inevitably we'd have to stretch these things out. It's going to take five or six months and then end up paying more. And it was all, we were doing the same work. We were working with the same people. The, their end product was the same. The only thing different was the rhythm. Yeah. And so we learned to adjust that. We had to bake in different turnaround times, depending on who we were dealing with, how quickly they could get around, what the expectations were, what the teams were. We learned to adjust on our end. Okay, you know what? We're not going to allocate, say, Justin, 100% on content strategy. I'll do 50% on Toyota, and then I'll do 50% on um, you know, Qualcomm for the next three months. That way I'll go back and forth. I'll, I'll be more versatile that way. We won't waste any time. Yeah. So there were a lot of adjustments just strategically, tactically that really all focused on rhythm. And yeah. again, establish your own rhythm, what you're comfortable with, what you're best at. Be aware of your colleagues and your partners and your clients' rhythms. And that, that could be for a six month engagement, or it could be a six minute phone call. Yeah. How quickly they speak, how long they pause, feel the room, understand the rhythm. If your audience is falling asleep, maybe pick up the pace of your speech a little more. Maybe pick up the loudness of your voice. If they appear cowed, maybe mellow it out a little bit. <laughs> so that's a little rhythm. You know, you said aware, and I was when you were talking about this, I thought I was thinking about a concept from you know karate, which is sanshin. Sanshin means awareness, and being aware, like a great martial artist, if they walk into a, a room, they will notice why is that person sad, why is they happy, like what's going on there. There's something behind me that doesn't feel good, and that that's an awareness and. When it comes to awareness and rhythm, I think it's crucial in life, but I think the main thing is that something that is innate or can you train it and how do you train it? Because we're talking about those nuances that distinguish a great business person from a mediocre and on paper, they're, they look the same, right? But we can't, that's why people sometimes have like, why does this person excel so much? Because of the awareness and rhythm. Uh, but how do we train that? Is that innate or like, what? what's your thoughts on that? We all bring to the table different innate skills. Yeah. And there's a lot of obvious character traits that maybe you can't change too much. I mean, we have genes that dictate that kind of steer us towards adventurism or uh, risk-taking or not, right? Or managerial versus um, a team player versus, you know, all different character traits. But of course, anything can be worked on and trained. And that concept of once 
a mind is introduced to a new concept, it will, once a mind is stretched to a new idea, it'll never return to its original dimensions. Yeah. You can't help but see the world in a little different way if you're introduced to a really new idea that stretches yourself a little bit. So, of course, when you train yourself in a very new skill, you'll start finding ways to apply it. You'll start seeing new opportunities to apply it, right? If you buy a yellow Volkswagen, all of a sudden you see a bunch of yellow Volkswagens on the road, yeah. right? I think that's, that applies. Yeah. So, yes. Most things can be trained. You can't coach seven foot, as they say. Like, I could never be an NBA center because yeah. I'll never be seven foot tall. But a lot of other things, of course, I can learn. Yeah, I think that the hard part when it comes to rhythm is like, how do you coach rhythm? Because I've seen this in the martial arts world. Uh, like pace, timing, rhythm. It's very hard to coach that. Because you can coach the technique, but to understand when to do what against which person in which scenario, uh, I feel, I guess in the martial art, arts world, it comes with experience of doing a lot of fighting, right? Uh, because you learn uh, the more you practice, I guess, probably the same in table tennis and I guess business too. For sure. It's repetition. <clears throat> Again, check the boxes. <clears throat> check the boxes so you're not so focused on, oh, I've got to, I've got to come up with this certain three day, three month, three year business plan, whatever, or this strategy. If you do enough of those over time, you know that your your brain will not be scrambling to cover the fundamentals. Those are already covered then your brain can work on a higher level, right? So it's repetition, it's experience, it's making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and you learn from, I mean, Pong principle uh, number seven, you learn more from your losses than your wins. Yeah. Wins, they fill us with happy chemicals, with the dopamine and the serotonin. And so it, it masks your ability to remember and learn from those often. It feels so good. Even if you win in overtime, yeah. it could have gone either way. You win. It's like, yes, all you're thinking about is I did it, which is great. And you should feel fantastic. If there was just that one little tiny millimeter difference and the ball bounced the other way and you lost, you're like, oh my God, it's crushing. It's devastating. What did I do wrong? Your natural inclination is like, oh, I sucked in that moment. What did I do wrong? And then it's a natural process to evaluate. Oh, if I just did that one thing or if I just understood that principle a little better. And so use that, use that pain. It's very useful of that loss, very instructive. And it'll drive you to survive that the next time. Yeah. I'm glad you, that was actually the next principle I wanted to talk to you about. Okay. Uh, so what has been your, like, when you look back at your life, one of your biggest, you know, losses and what did you learn from that experience? Let's see. I've had my first two, I've only been in um, two, I've only been in two finals in a major tournament. And um, so, and I lost both of them. So I got, I have two silver and two bronze medals from, I play a lot of tournaments, like a lot, but I only, only have four medals from major tournaments. Yeah. Uh, like the US Open, US Nationals. And this is like the uh, what I call the semi-pro division. It's not the open, um, but still highly competitive. And those two losses in the final, the first one, I didn't feel bad about at all. Yeah. First of all, I was happy to be there, which is dangerous. You don't want to just be happy to be there if you want to win. Yeah. But the other guy was so much better than me and I barely squeaked into the semifinal. I barely got the semifinal win. So I was like, I was relieved. There was no way, I really think there was just no way I was going to beat the guy. So it's like, okay, I'm so happy just to be here. I got a silver. This was amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know if I learned that much except to understand that control what I can control and don't worry about the rest. Because every time you win a medal, it is a confluence of so many different things. Everything has to line up, as you know, right? 
you have to be feeling great. You have to be your sleep cycles, your nutrition, your mental, your physical training. Everything has to come out great. Plus the luck of the draw, who you are matched against is critical because it's a game of matchups. We all have different styles, right? You can't control that. This guy was just far and away much better than me. Okay. So I made it silver. Cool. I don't know if I learned that much, but just like be happy that I made it that far. Yeah. Okay. The next loss, th that other one was really tight. It was a long time nemesis of mine in the final. And that one I still think about because <laughs> it, it could have been my one gold. And I don't honestly know if I could have done that much differently, but I mean, like it, I still remember it was the, the first, it was best of three out of five. The first match was 11, nine. I won. And they, okay. I can take this guy. This is, it's really close. 11, nine, but he was a, a little older and wiser than me. He's really crafty. The next one was deuce and he won at deuce. So when it goes 10 to 10, you have to win by two. And he, I think he won 13, 11. Ooh. It's like, oh, and, and you know, I, you know, if I just got one net dribbler or he didn't get that one net dribbler, it could have gone anyway. And so it's like, okay, I got no problem. He got lucky, whatever. I, I got this next one. He also won at deuce 13, 11. So I'm down two one. And that's, those are kind of crushing because it could have gone either way. I could have been up two one or three Oh, and then and I'm um, laughing because I think this is so, this is the beauty of life. <laughs> yes, it is. It is the beauty and pain and, <laughs> And uh, mosaic of life because the we're price all of being in the arena. <laughs> yes, and the, but it, it was it was in the moment I felt like okay, this is why I'm here. It's like yeah. this is what I live for. This is like those exciting moments can go either way. You just don't know. Running as fast as you can, and there's a guy right there exactly even with you, and he's running as fast as he can. You just don't know. And so the the fourth game though, I felt uh, I think I felt my spirit snap a little bit <clears throat> when he was up maybe eight five <clears throat> that's a big lead yeah in a way it was like it was maybe you know seven five six four i'm right there but then went up eight five i shouldn't have i, I don't know it's that intangible and i can feel it on the other side too when you just, just that little bit of snap and you break the other guy's spirit and i think i just felt that a little bit almost subconsciously and i have to learn to play every point like it's this whole world unto itself you know and i learned and i it reinforces to me and i lost that match so he I, he won maybe 11 to 7 and um and i'll never you know i'll never get that one back um i learned that there's only one point ever an entire match is only one point because it's the point you're playing right now you can't play the last point you can't play the next point. You can only play the point you're playing right now. And if you play that one point over and over and over again with exactly the same focus and drive and desire, then the rest will take care of itself, right? But like I say in football, <clears throat> there's no 14 point play. You can only get one touchdown at a time. So as soon as you start looking too far ahead or as soon as you start looking back, you can sink yourself. Of course, you need to think strategically, like what's been working so far. Yeah. But that's different than wallowing or getting emotions in your way. It's psychology and rhythm. And you can tell that, you know, in in a martial arts match, in a soccer match, in a, in a ping pong, like when that losing point gets your mind off track for just 10 seconds. And then another one. And then like, it's, it's so interesting, but it's also like, how do you have, you probably taught a lot about this. Like, what's your advice on like going back into reality and like, okay, I lost that one. Now we're here. Because I think that's what gets us in life with relationships, with business, with uh, friendships, with ourselves, with finances. Like, how do we get back to, no, that was it. Now we're here. Yeah. <clears throat> Ritual has a big, big part to play in that. For example, we can establish rituals. Sometimes we do it without even thinking about it, but like it can be as simple as a, as a pat on the chest, 
uh, you see tennis players before they serve, you know, they'll tickle their nose, they'll do some of their ear, they'll bounce the ball four times exactly, right? That taps into our subconscious, which then triggers other subconscious ready state positions. So we all have to realize, okay, either if I don't have ritual, make one and just do it every single time. And then it, you just, it snaps you into a different zone of thinking. Like, okay, no, nothing else matters. I'm locked in again. And I have certain rituals for different uh, pre-match, during the match, even post-match. I'll, you know, if it's a really tense situation, I'll just force myself to smile. Like I'll be sitting there. Okay. It's deuce in the fifth. I'll just smile. I'm like, and it, it's like, it relaxes me and it reminds me, oh, why am I here? No one's forcing me to do this. I'm doing this all on my own. This is, no one says you have to do, go put yourself through this. I'm, I should be having fun or at least enjoying the situation. This is what I worked for. So I could be in tense situations. This is not punishment. <laughs> Sometimes we have to remind ourselves like, like this huge presentation I'm going to do, I have butterflies. I'm, you know, had to go to the bathroom before this, you know, this is not punishment. I asked to be here and I'm privileged to be here. Right. So that's a good reminder. I try to tell myself, like, I'm so lucky I get to be stressed out right now. Yeah, right. I think Serena, was it Venus or Serena Williams that said pressure is a privilege or their coach? Uh, and I think I'm, when it, when you talked about this, uh, uh, you know, creating something, I thought about uh, Wayne Otto, a nine-time karate champion that I had on my podcast. And he, like, he always got this question, like, why, like, how do you become a nine-time world champion? Because most people quit after one, two times, like you're already the best, like what else is out there? But it, for him, he said it was never about that. And before every game, if you watch his videos or every fight, he does this and he says to himself, to the best of my abilities. And I think that was such a cool thing. Uh, and that's what when we're looking at great champions it's a world play again you know if you're out there listening to this podcast now maybe you can't relate to a world champion or somebody like justin or like me but you can relate to that ability of creating something at the best of your ability and making that an adventure uh, so i think that the game of world word play is also super important oh yeah because it's not just words it words tie directly into thoughts, emotions, and yeah. logic, right? Upon principle 14, I've got to bring up now, yeah. reach for excellence, <laughs> not success. Yeah. And that's all about, if you aim at the target, you'll hit the target and that gets you the trophy. If you aim at the trophy, you'll miss the target and that gets you nothing. That's a, and that's a quote. That's not mine. That's a quote that starts the chapter. Yeah. If in every moment, all you do is look at that ball in table tennis and say, what does that ball need? I'm going to give it exactly what it needs to accomplish my goals. And it's going to go where I want it to go. Yeah. And you're not even thinking about the opponent. You're not thinking about the match. You're not thinking about the trophy yeah. or people watching you. All you're thinking about is what does that ball need in the moment? And then do it again and again. And pretty soon, oh, you won the point. And then start over with the next point. And you're reaching for an excellent flow and an excellent execution, but you're not thinking about results. As soon as you think about results, then it all kind of dissipates and you lose that focus. So that's, that's the frame of mind. And that could be any kind of business negotiation, any kind of report you're working on, any kind of strategy, look down at what you need to do right in front of you, do it the best possible way you can to your abilities without any regard to the external situation and who you're working with, what's going on. The rest can take care of itself. Yeah, I love it. That's that's in my inbox, actually, an email that is unopened, so I see it every time. It says, committed to the process, unattached to the outcome. Obviously, that's very difficult, and I'm not there every, every time, sure. but it's a reminder. Uh, Justin, we don't have too much time this has been so fun so maybe we'll, we'll have to bring you back or hopefully i can come and play some ping pong with you i really would love to uh just want to talk about uh, pong principle number nine because i think that's something that's interesting to me embrace your quirks can you just talk about that and uh, 
but maybe we'll end end there. Sure. That was partly inspired by Valerie Condos Field, who is this amazing gymnastics coach at UCLA, women's gymnastics. She was voted Pac-10 Coach of the Century in women's gymnastics, I believe. Uh, Six, seven national championships. She has never competed a day of her life in gymnastics. She uh -huh. is a dancer. So somehow she got this head coaching job, never having competed as a gymnast. And she felt very insecure when she got this job. She's ambitious and talented, yes, and confident even, but she felt very insecure at that moment. And she realized she can't be a gymnastics coach. She has to be a performance coach. She has to be a um, exhibition coach and a glamour coach, right? So she knew her quirk, her individual uniqueness, which she got a lot of flack for, and maybe even insults for originally, was she knew how to let these girls shine and smile and connect with the judges and the audience. That was her quirk. And it turned out to be an amazing strength. Yeah. Right. So in for me personally, and the, and I have a friend who's in the Olympics right now. He just qualified for the third Olympics. Actually kind of wow. similar. He's much better than me, but similar circumstances. Awesome. Our basement was kind of cramped growing up. And we I only had about three or four feet on each end of the table to play. So I had to learn also, I was smaller. I had to learn to be a close to the table player, very aggressive, cover the angles. I couldn't back up much and swing, big swing, power swing. So I was a finesse, touch, and quick quickness player. Same with him, Kanak Jaw, amazing player. He, in his garage, did not have a lot of space. So he started out being more of a blocker, quick reflexes, and he got a lot of... Um, he got some negative comments from some of his coaches. Like, look, you're never going to be a big league player. You're not never going to advance to the top if you, you know, without this power, without the big, bold movements. And he, he tried that and it wasn't exactly the, his optimist playing style. So his quirk was he needed to be a little closer generally. And kind of same with me. Again, I kind of equate our games because he's much better, but that's my quirk. And I've, I've used it to my advantage because other people need to, they naturally gravitate back to get more time and more power, but I move up closer when other people would move back and it it's surprising and it puts people off their game. So that's a shortcoming that I tried to leverage into a strength. It's my quirk. And he's done very well. My buddy Kanak Ja, who is cracked the world top 20 and is a U.S. national champion many times over using that particular quirk very well to his advantage. I love that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I think that that kind of ends this perfectly, like have the courage to be you and to show up uniquely in the world. And uh, there is like, if you look at the best in almost any given field, the reason why they're the best is because they broke the rules and uh, they broke the rules of the game. That's, that's the honest truth. And if you want to become something extraordinary, not for others, but in your own life, it's amazing to express yourself as the human being you are. Justin, before I let you go, is there anything you felt like I should have asked you, but I, I missed that you would like to share? I mean, we could have gone any number of directions with your background and, and mine. I, I would just say we all have different tables in life. Mine happens to be a ping pong table, but negotiating table, graphic artist table, AI, uh, we all have different platforms we, we interact with. And don't be ashamed or embarrassed or feel constrained by whatever table you excel at, because there is a niche somewhere for you to really excel and break the mold. And um, that's an important lesson that I took a long time to learn. And I'm not saying if you're just in love with doing Dorito art, that's going to like propel you to stardom and fame and riches, but um, there's ways to apply your skills out there and you can be pretty successful if you're strategic enough. So yeah, that's a, a general point, but I think it's an important one. Yeah. If people want to connect with you, learn more about you, read your book, Justin, what, what's the best uh, approach to get in touch? You can... Just go to pingpongleadership.com and learn all about the book and the concepts, and you can contact me through there. 
or reach out at, I'm on LinkedIn, Justin Bookie, just search. It's a unique name, B-O-O-K-E-Y. You can find me pretty easily. I love to talk table tennis and ping pong principles to anybody. Awesome. Thank you, everybody that are still here with us, listening, watching. In this day and age, to ask for an hour of someone's time, I think it's a big ask, so I salute you. I'm grateful that you are here, but I refuse to make shorter content podcasts because this is the minimum time for us to connect. I think we could probably talk for another two hours and had a lot to say and share, uh, but uh, thanks again. If you enjoy this show, I have a big mission. I want to help 10 million people in 10 years to go after their dreams. Please share it with somebody that you think can get value from this show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, go and like us. Write a review on iTunes or Spotify. I'm grateful for all of the support. If you want to share your dreams, your goals with me, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. It just gives me fuel, adds more power to my message and Feedback is one of the best things you can get in life. So I would love to hear from you and connect with you. Thanks again to everybody. And thanks again to Justin for coming on. We so much appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.